it's on Marx and the theory of the state and domination and uh, the poverty of progressivism and uh, whatever else he's doing. Uh, at this moment, he is member of the editorial board of Descent magazine, and also he is currently the uh, editor of uh, the Professional Journal of American Political Science Association, Perspectives of, on Politics, which is our association's most, Im I mean, one of them. Yeah, I wouldn't say most. One of the two most important journals, uh, where also you have the book reviews are published there, and the exciting pieces like. Uh, since one of the questions here was about what is and what is not relevant about a commission like the one that some people associate with my name, I prefer to call it all the time the Commission for the Analysis of the Communist Dictatorship in Romania. It's not my commission, Horia Patabi, which was a member of the commission, plus 16 other people, plus 35 experts. It's a little bit, in my view, unfair to be always focused on one individual. I know it's, it's, a, it's a shorthand. But uh, given the, the work of all the other people, I think that we should take together both the, the glory and the blame. Uh, okay, so uh, not, not just one person. I know that Mircea Mihai is actually the person who coined this. Uh, my good friend. You, you need a friend for things like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Jeff is going to... He has written actually several uh, articles, which I consider seminal uh, on this topic. One came out in the pages of our professional journal in the field, uh, subfield of political theory, and it came out, uh, in, and I remember because I was at this concert for one of the here, the Wilson Center, that's how we met 15 years ago or so. Okay, and it was love at first sight. I mean, it worked very fast. Okay, so ever since at that moment we've been in touch and we've been working together on many things. And uh, okay, so that he published two articles which were widely discussed. One is uh, about the meanings of 1989, which is an article that starts in a Popperian way, uh, challenging uh, monocausal explanations or mono-effect uh, interpretations. Uh, and the other article is the one that came out in the journal Political Theory. The, the meanings of 89 came out in Social Research, published by the New School. And the other one came out in the, uh, in the let's say, uh, Mecca of political theory, okay, in Political Theory Journal, and it's called The Strange Silence of Political Theory, questioning uh, the reactions of uh, political theory in, in the West to some, to the, uh, whatever you want to call them, revolutions or rebirths or uh, uh, ruptures or whatever, cleavages or chesuras or whatever else. They were earth-shattering events. At least this, I think, that all the participants in this uh, in this conference would agree. So they were earth-shattering events, which started obviously as Gail Stokes showed, and other people started earlier than 1989. But we consider 1989 as one year that captures, brings together all this. Uh, these uh, issues, as since Tim Gordon Nash's name has been mentioned several times, and since the New York Review played such an important role during those years, so did Times Literary Supplement. And but the fact that you know it's quite interesting what uh, how the titles come. You know that usually the titles are given by the editors. It's not the author who comes, at least in these journals. And my title was completely different one for the cover story in TLS, and it came. Interesting, the editor, uh, Peter Stothart, came with the title, and it's simple. They want it to be free. Uh, while, the, while the New York Review came with another title, 1989, exclamation mark. <laughs> okay, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vladimir. I'd like to thank Vladimir Anbogdan for organizing the conference, and also the Romanian Cultural Institute, uh, which does lots of important work, including very... Uh, uh, very generously organizing conferences here. This is the second one I've attended, so I'd like to thank Horia and Mercha, and I will, I will come back to that um, in a moment. Um, I was going to start with a joke about the TV show Baywatch, but I, I won't. Um, <laughs> well, I will, actually. My ex-wife, Debbie, always joked with me that um, I was the David Hasselhoff of American political theory, uh, because uh, as <laughs> who's who? Because, as you know, the show Baywatch, the TV show Baywatch, uh, actually Vladimir's comment on cleavage reminded me of that. Uh, the show Baywatch um, it was very big in Eastern Europe and not so much here. Uh, David Hasselhoff, I, I understand, is like uh, very big in Romania. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate the very kind words of Vladimir about my work. It's a pleasure to be here.
Um, so as the, uh, uh, I've listened uh, to as much of the conference as I could. I was unable to attend this morning's session. I'm very sorry about that. I did read all the papers. And my goal here is to reflect uh, in general on the conference, its theme and its proceedings, and in these closing comments to offer some general reflections, perhaps some synthesis and uh, definitely some uh, uh, provocation for further thought, um, if for no other reason so that next year we can have another conference. Hopefully, I'll be invited. The Fairfax is a very nice place, by the way. Um, so uh, the, the title of my talk is Revisiting the Meanings of 1989. It, it's a contingent fact that I wrote this piece called The Meanings of 1989, it's all, and that I was actually invited to give it here at the Wilson Center, and that I met Vladimir, and well, the rest uh, is, is history. So in any case, I was invited here. Uh, it, by virtue of that piece. So I, I want to say just something very briefly about it as a way of moving beyond it. So this piece came out in 1996. Um, it, it called into question uh, a then emergent consensus or, or appear, apparent emergent consensus uh, about uh, 1989 as representing an end of history. I argued in this piece, in this piece that uh, such an end of history thesis minimized the importance of the most exciting developments of 1989, the non-electoral forms of anti-political politics improvised by the Central European democratic oppositions who sought to resist communism and to constitute democratic uh, spaces within uh, an authoritarian or post-totalitarian setting. In seeking to defend the ongoing valid validity and exemplary character of such an anti-political politics, I was merely one voice among many Western political theorists drawn to this politics um, who sought to keep alive a sense of historical possibility and in particular to indicate ways that Western liberal democracy itself beset by a growing sense of democratic disaffection had something to learn from the recent experience of Central Europe. My point was not to question the importance of instituting the rule of law or representative government in Eastern Europe, but to insist that both the spirit of revolt and the repertoires of collective action enacted by the anti-communist dissidents were of continuing relevance even under a liberal democratic regime which would not represent an end of history even if it represented a welcome development. That was then and this is now. Um, only 20 years have passed since that miraculous year of 1989 and yet momentous changes have occurred actualizing certain possibilities for closing others and settling what had seemed only a short time ago in question, at least for some of us. Eastern Europe is now firmly in the fold of the EU and NATO, and most of its political elites, including some of the most celebrated former dissidents, have become bona fide proponents of a new Europe in league with the US. Thoroughly and rapidly incorporated within the structures of global capitalism, most Eastern European nation states have also experienced the consolidation of more or less stable liberal democratic electoral institutions. Things are far from perfect, for liberal democracy is an anti-perfectionist form of politics. And the processes of transition have been far from smooth, as witnessed by the acrimonious politics of lustration, and very vividly by the wars of post-Yugoslavian succession. At the same time, notions of some kind of third way, I really appreciated uh, Cornell's paper before, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly about that later as well. Some um, notions of some kind of third way or a new form of transnational democracy from below, as envisioned by the Helsinki Citizens Assembly and advocated by people like Mary Kaldor and even rhapsodized on occasion by Havel himself, now seem rather quaint. And it is hard to avoid the judgment that the past 20 years of post-communism have witnessed the beneficent and successful transition from communism to liberalism in Eastern Europe. Case closed. In 1996, Adam Micknick, articulating the sensibility of many post-1989 former dissidents, famously declare, declared that gray is beautiful. Whereas the 20th century had been a century of ideological frenzy and political extremism, whether under black or red banners, those are his words, people such as himself who had been subjected to such frenzy were now exhausted and chastened and no longer excited by the colorations of utopia. Micknick thus embraced the blandness of liberal democracy for, and I quote him, democracy is neither red, black nor red. Democracy is gray. It is established only with difficulty and its quality and its flavor can be recognized best when it loses under the pressure of advancing red or black radical ideas. Dictatorships, whether red or black, destroy the human capacity for creation. Only gray democracy, with its human rights and institutions of civil society, can replace weapons with arguments. That is why we say gray is beautiful. 
It is worth underscoring that Micknick was describing a sensibility but also prescribing a stance in a situation that was still somewhat unsettled. Far from declaring the ideological victory of liberal democracy, he was insisting on the importance of liberal democracy as a source of ethical and political commitment, as something with enemies and thus in need of defending. Furthermore, the liberal democratic ideals and practices being affirmed by him were worthy precisely by virtue of their openness. To quote him, only democracy, having the capacity to question itself, also has the capacity to correct its own mistakes, unquote. There was nothing complacent about this declaration. To the contrary, it had a certain understandable urgency. At the same time, it was sobering and quite deliberately, well, drab. Only a few years before the New York Times journalist Thomas Friedman would declare that the world is flat, Micknick was prescribing a colorless gray. It was almost as if turning a page from Hannah Arendt's famous notion of the banality of evil, he was insist insisting on what we might call the good of banality. Banality is, well, banal, and it is easy to despair of it, for gray is many things, but beautiful does not seem one of them. Micknick well knew this, which is why his words were so deliberately provocative. At the same time, while gray is drab, dismal, and dull, uh, it is also calm and comforting, particularly to the overstimulated, and it would be a presumptuous intellectual conceit to underestimate the value of such calm for societies who had experienced a short century of mass murder, occupation, ideological volatility, and insecurity. Much that has happened in the past 20 years would thus seem to bolster Micknick's embrace of the beautiful gray of liberal democracy. Not simply the normalization of formerly East European countries now incorporated within a broader Europe of common markets and common constitutional values, but also the rise of ethno-chauvinism and ethnic conflict in many of the former Soviet republics far, farther east, the rise of Islamist political extremism throughout the Middle East and indeed its transplantation to parts of Western Europe, and the so-called war on terror led by the United States and its allies, and the measures taken in prosecuting this war, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the obsession with homeland security, uh, what many scholars uh, have called the broad securitization of politics. In the face of these developments, some heartening and many very disturbing, it is hard to dispute Micknick's celebration of liberal banality as an achievement to be prized and an aspiration to be pursued. In the same way that 20 years ago we celebrated the revolutions of 1989, we are powerfully disposed to celebrate the liberal course of these revolutions and to welcome their progeny into the embattled fold of liberal democracy and the rule of law, and rightly so. At the same time, it would be ironic indeed if in the very name of liberal values we were to endorse a post-historical grand narrative that in effect relieved us of the burden of responsibility for our own future and uh, uh, obscured from view the possibility of political agency and choice. And so as I did in this 1996 essay, I will resist such a narrative, again quoting from Albert Camus, who noted, and I quote, history as an entirety could exist only in the eyes of an observer outside it and outside the world. History exists only in the final sense for God, unquote. I hope that I can simply presume that we liberals agree with Camus that humans are not God, that we are a plurality of individuals who, th who are thoroughly immersed in a complex world not of our own choosing, who cannot know history in the final sense, and yet who are forced by circumstance to discern its meanings and act in accordance with our discernments and to judge these actions in a never-ending process of living between past and future. In this sense, the meaning of 1989 remains inherently plural and contestable and revisable in the light of experience, and experience is plural. And even from the vantage point of a liberal democratic appreciation for the accomplishments of 1989, it is both possible and necessary to continually rethink this appreciation. In my comments this afternoon, I want to encourage and provoke such a rethinking. Such a stance is hardly radical. It is indeed a hallmark of modern democratic politics founded on dramatic political ruptures, whether revolutionary or revolutionary, or re rebirthing, <laughs> to continually rethink the meaning of the founding moment and to question the claims of the present to incarnate this moment. Such imminent criticism is an essential dimension of the rhetorical politics of modern democracy. As historians of the American and French revolutions have made clear, Indeed, uh, the French political theorist Claude Lafour has developed his political theory of democratic openness on the basis of this insight. Speaking on the 4th of July, a decade before the U.S. Civil War, ex-slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass 
powerfully called into question the meaning of a revolution in 1776, the American Revolution, uh, that decades later had become uncritically celebrated by all. This is what he said in a famous speech, the 4th of July oration. It was in 1852. Uh, to say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. Everybody can say it. The dastard, not less than the noble brave, can flippantly discant on the tyranny of England. It is fashionable to do so, but there was a time when it tried men's souls. They who did so were accounted in their day plotters of mischief, agitators and rebels, dangerous men. To side with the right against the wrong, with the weak against the strong, and with the oppressed against the oppressor, here lies the merit and the one which, of all others, seems unfashionable in our day. This is Frederick Douglass writing, uh, talking actually to an audience of white Americans celebrating freedom in a society uh, that basically owns uh, people such as himself. I speak from a vantage point very different from that occupied by Douglas. I don't claim his subject position in any way. And my point is not that there currently exists a cause as compelling as the abolition of slavery was in Douglass's day. But at the same time, I surely think that if democracy means anything, it means attentiveness to the possibility that such uh, compelling issues exist and a public sphere that is hospitable to such questions being posed. In this sense, democracy is above all a system of collective political attentiveness and responsibility to what C. Wright Mills once called the present as history and the future as responsibility. With this important notion in mind, I'd like to briefly delineate four ways in which the we who celebrate the Velvet Revolutions of 1989 ought to do so with circumspection and with a sense of self-limitation. I will conclude not by repudiating Micknick's uh, celebration of Gray, but by suggesting that if liberal democracy is best seen as Gray, and of course this is a metaphor, we ought to realize that there are many shades of Gray, and indeed that while the broad gr zone of Gray that comprises normal democratic politics may efface the bold reds blacks, and browns of the last century. It also blends a, a, a complex palette of more welcoming colors, from the pink of sexual and gender freedom to the green of contemporary environmentalism to the orange, rose, and violet colors of the relatively recent color revolutions in Europe and beyond. Understood as such a complex blend, liberal democracy is neither dull nor banal. It is an extraordinary form of ordinary politics capable of incorporating both the rule of law and a perpetual openness to the claims of justice in a combination that is uneasy, chronically unstable, and enormously compelling. It is, in short, an unfinished and unfinishable project in which 1989, as reality and as symbol, is a watershed and touchstone and a cautionary tale. So I want to develop four points really quickly. And the most well-developed in this text, which uh, I didn't really get to finish, is the first point. I'll probably spend most of my time on the first point. Let me just say what the four points are, and I'll at least say something about each of them. And Vladimir, who I know is not looking at his watch, is responsible for holding me to 30 minutes, so whatever. Excellent. Multi-talented. <laughs> Multitasking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you start my time from when you gave your brief introduction? Okay, all right, just good. So here are the four, the four uh, points I want to make. Who are we? I want to raise some questions about that. Who are the we who commemorate 1989? Second, why do we matter if we do? I think we do. Let me say a few things about why we do. Then I want to say something about, if we do, the ways that we matter. I want to develop here very schematically this uh, metaphor of shades of gray. By the way, I don't think Micknick would agree with this, shades of gray. Uh, and then fourthly, I want, to, I want to talk about a couple of what I will call paradoxes of political judgment. And I've subtitled this part of my talk, which is absolutely least developed part of the talk, but it's the part where I actually address some of the things that Jeff Herf said and Al Agnes Heller yesterday, and I, I like and admire them both, I don't, but I want to disagree with them. So uh, in th this part of the talk the, 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 has the subtitle, Why Graying Political Theorists Ought to Resist Judging in Black and White. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about me, my friend. I'm explaining my own judgments. I could see. Yeah, yours is all black. I could see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so who are we who celebrates 1989? Um, this, this paper began with a, with a, uh, a gloss on Kant, and I'm, I didn't read the quote, so I'm not going to gloss it either. Um, 
There was not now, nor has there ever been a universal enthusiasm for 1989. We who currently the, commemorate the events so signified are a complex, diverse, and fractured we. And indeed, we include many who did not celebrate then, or who celebrated then, but not so much now, or who do not sincerely celebrate now, or whose sincere celebration now means some very different things. This may well be disillusioning to those drawn to a heroic and moralistic narrative of civil society against the state or living in truth, and such a narrative has great appeal, perhaps even more to vicarious spectators such as myself than to actual participants like some people in this room. It is thrilling to imagine that one's political sensibilities merge into an encompassing movement of all right-thinking people, even if only for a moment, 1989. At the same time, we ought to know better, especially we liberals. For if contemporary political liberalism means anything, it means an awareness, not simply that that God has failed, the God that failed, you know, communism, but that in a political sense, God is dead, at least to us. Differences of affiliation and opinion are an essential feature of the human condition, and human judgments, even the best of them, are fallible. And a politics that thinks otherwise is liable to arrogance at best and arrogation of power at worst. Joined together in opposition to communist authoritarianism in 1989 were a range of political groupings holding a range of opinions whose tensions and antagonisms hurried to the surface after the fall. Opinions about the efficacy and justice of markets, the proper structure of a representative democracy, and even in some case its desirability, uh, the moral and political status of national and ethnic identities and the extent to which politics ought to serve such identities, the role of religion in politics. We really haven't talked much about that, um, but it's an important issue and it's a contentious one. The rights of minorities, the freedom of the press, and uh, particularly something that really hasn't been thematized here, I will say a few things about it later, the extent to which social justice reaches to questions of gender and sexuality. We here who participate together in this common commemoration of 1989 uh, no doubt disagree about some or all of those things, strongly, some of them. Some of the disagreements have surfaced, uh, some of them haven't surfaced because we haven't really talked about the things, but if we did talk about them, and I think my point really is we ought to, we would see that we disagree. And beyond this academic conference of intellectuals, there is an even broader range of opinions on the answers to these questions. This is true among those who join in celebration of 1989, who throughout Eastern Europe are often antagonistic contestants for political power, even if through electoral means, but also those who never celebrated unreconstructed communists, triumphalists, nationalists, and those who once joined in activism and celebration, but who have in different ways changed their minds, as some people do. Some people become depressed by the sense that the re revolution betrayed. Some people become opponents of the revolution. Um, we liberals even turn some of those people into heroes sometimes. In some ways, my point here is obvious. A banal fact about the plurality of opinions in a democratic society no longer cowed into ideological submission. But my point is not simply factual, it is normative as well. For 1989 means different things to different individuals and constituencies and is the source of ongoing and legitimate debate, as all debate must be legitimate in a liberal democracy. In the same way that there is a tendency during moments of revolutionary upheaval to be swept up by a sense of historical movement and to obscure real differences in the name of an enthusiasm for liberation, there is a tendency during moments of commemoration of revolution for a similar forgetfulness to occur. That was Frederick Douglass's point. It is a point of continuing rele relevance even for us. For even the best narratives can sometimes be somewhat forgetful. And I want to cite a case in point. Um, and the case in point, which I want to talk about only very briefly, and I do this as the provocateur that I am, and as the liberal that I am, invited here by my liberal friends to talk about the meanings of 1989, which was some kind of radical change. The piece I want to talk about is a just published essay entitled The Revolutions of 1989, Causes, Meanings, Consequences, written by my close friend and colleague, our conference organizer, Vladimir Tismaniana. I cite this piece because I am in fundamental agreement with virtually every one of its arguments regarding the complexity of the 1989 revolutions and their legacies, uh, and regarding the political importance of defending liberal values in the face of their continued vulnerability. There's very little politically separating what I think from what Vladimir argues in this piece. 
Uh, my point is that even in this most careful of essays, a certain rhetorical slippage occurs in the name of the we of 1989. And I want to say something about it very briefly. Uh, observing that liberal values are under siege, my, flen, my friend Vladimir writes, and I quote, one reason for the rise of populist, politically fundamentalist movements is the presence of the paternalist temptation, the need for protection against the destabilizing effects of the transition to market and competition. Political reform in all these post-communist societies has not gone far enough in creating the counter-majoritarian institutions, independent media, market economy, political parties, that would diminish the threat of new authoritarian experiments catering to the subliminal but powerful egalitarian populist sentiments. That's a quote. Now, this is an opinion that is born of reflective experience and nourished by historical understanding, and it is opinion with which I largely agree. But it is an opinion, and it is possible to substantially disagree with this opinion without putting oneself beyond the pale of liberalism in all its shades of gray. I don't mean to suggest that Vladimir would, would want to put a disagreement beyond the pale. But I just want to talk a little bit about this. And in doing so, I want to – actually, this is one of the places where I'm going to echo some of the points made by Cornell. Um, it may well be the case that the dismantling of communism required the introduction of relatively untrammeled markets, indeed even of shock therapy. But, but the observation here registers none of the tragedy of this. Indeed, the need for protection against the destabilizing effects of the transition to market and capitalism, described here as a paternalist temptation driven by subliminal populism, could also be described as a demand for social justice in response to the inherent insecurities of a capitalist market economy. Likewise, in considering the kinds of institution building necessary amidst the new conditions, no mention is made of the institutions of the social welfare state. Now again, there may well be very good reasons for believing that the imperatives of, tra of transition or the EU uh, and its succession requirements or global financial institutions limit such institutions, welfare institutions, in the post-communist context of the past 20 years or now. It may be that given the rhetorical power of anti-liberalism, it is civil liberties and an open public sphere and not questions of distributive justice as affected through welfare state institutions and forms of regulated capitalism that deserve pride of place. It may be. In fact, I would argue that these things are true. But these are pragmatic political arguments in actual or potential competition with other arguments about the balance between equality and efficiency and the demands of distributive versus political justice in diverse post-communist settings. And while these are arguments that certainly contend with anti-liberal positions that pose real dangers in the East European context, it is, these are also arguments that exist within liberalism itself. What follows in the paper is a discussion of uh, a person here who many people know. He was actually at this 1999 conference that Vladimir organized in Budapest, Tamash. Um, I, I'm going to delete Tamash from my, this talk for a number of reasons. But um, I find him interesting. I will delete him completely. Except to say that in this quotation that I have here, he says that th th there's a lot, a lot of immiseration after 1989, and that's a bad thing. Okay, And it, in fact, it's only that observation of his that I'm interested in. Lots of other observations I'm not interested in. Ten yeah? More Ten more. <laughs> You've become a very good timekeeper, huh? Okay. All right. Yes. I know. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's fine. So um, what I've done here then, I would like to, I could quote from a number of people, David Ost, uh, Anne Snittile has a very interesting piece in Descent Magazine about the effects of the transition for many women, particularly not... Uh, let's say, upper middle class women in Eastern Europe. Um, Timothy Gart Nash was quoted in yesterday's New York Times as saying basically this same thing. And indeed, Agnes Heller in her piece, uh, that, not that she, she didn't present this, but in, in her piece that was in Eurozine 20 years after, she basically says, and I quote, we've been unable to communicate our image and knowledge of the new world that we've entered. Maybe we've been so preoccupied with the political agenda of the day that we fail to consider the broader aspects and interconnections of our new world. Do people really understand, if only a minority, the rules and opportunities of the world in which we live? If we say capitalism, they understand privatization, loss of jobs, and foreign capital. What do people really know about the market, she asks. And, and I think that this is an important point. Now, my point is not to condemn the course of the transition or to imply that there was any obvious alternative to the way the transition unfolded. It is to insist that the we who celebrate it are enormously complex, that in our commemoration, we ought to sustain the continued vitality of the revolutions of 1989 as ongoing forms of, uh, as ongoing questions of political contestation that include many 
uh, cogent criticisms. And, and, and so I'm going to move on here. The second point, the, the, so, so we ought to be very mindful of our plurality. We ought to be debating a whole series of things as well as commemorating what we have in common. That's point number one. Point number two, well, okay, fine. So we ought to be doing that, but who cares? Point number two relates to this question, well, how important are ideas anyway? Vladimir's work is, is seminal for this. And in fact, pretty much everything I know about uh, 1989, in some ways, was inspired by reading uh, Vladimir. Um, Vladimir talked a little bit about Stephen Kotkin's book, uh, which is a really interesting book that's come up in a number of different contexts. And, of course, Kotkin's argument is it was a crisis of the ruling elite and not any anti-political politics or civil society ideas or democratic idealism that really explains the uh, 1989. Um, in, in, in political science, there's a lot of similar discussion of the color revolutions. Uh, there's some very interesting uh, debates in the Journal of Democracy about this. Luke and Wei in, in wrote an interesting piece um, called What Really Explains the Colored Revolutions, in which he says it's not about these democratic activists. It's really um, about the crisis of ruling elites. In any case, so I, I, I would love to develop this point more, uh, in more depth, but I'm not going to. I'm simply going to say that my second point which I think many people in this room would agree with, certainly Vladimir would and, and, um, and Jeff Herfwood, and a lot of the talk today, uh, Carol's paper was really centered on this point, is that these ideas mattered and they matter. They matter politically. Uh, they matter politically not in some like vague mythical sense, but also in the sense that they have bearers. They persist in the world in connection with individuals, institutions, etc. They matter. And, and in other words, our ideas matter. We're part of that process of developing the ideas, and we matter. That's why our conferences matter. That's why this conference is such a great thing. And that's why we ought to be attentive to the range of things that we ought to be doing, the range of things. So point three relates to this range of things, shades of gray. And I'm going to be also really brief here because I want to get to the, the fourth point as well, uh, to be maximally provocative. And that is the, this whole idea of the shades of gray or a zone of gray. Um, what we think matters and the intellectual practices by which we nurture and sustain our thoughtfulness matter. So what I want to say is that there are a range of intellectual practices. In identifying this range of practices, I'm, I want to draw from Tony Jute's short book, The Burden of Responsibility. In this book, he explains how he, he has basically three models of intellectual responsibility, Albert Camus, Raymond Aron, and Leon Bloom. And each of them, according to uh, Jute, um, it embodies an exemplary kind of ethical and political responsibility. The, the, the responsibility of the moralist, in the case of Camus, of the social scientist, in the case of Aron, and of the politician, in the case of Bloom. Now, what's, what is wonderful about this book, it's not a deep theoretical account of anything, but what's really nice about the book is that it proceeds from the, the premise, which I think is a good liberal premise, that there are different domains of life, there are different ways of being a liberal, and there are, in fact, these different kinds of, let's say, civic virtue associated to diff diff uh, with different roles. Camus was responsible in a different way than Aron from within the confines of the, the academy was responsible, in a different way uh, in, in which uh, Bloom was. They answered to different constituencies, to different muses, whatever. Uh, I want to follow up on this idea, and I want to identify a range of intellectual practices that I want to say are, let's say, legitimate heirs of 1989. And what I want to say is, in fact, pretty much every one of these intellectual practices has been represented in the conference. So in, in a sense, in I, simply identifying them, I want to identify them as, in Jute's terms, different forms of intellectual responsibility. And this may be the most kind of like lame liberal aspect of my talk, because what I'm really getting at is we really ought to respect each other's differences and continue this conversation in a number of different directions. So what are these intellectual practices? The first intellectual practice is the intellectual practice that I would associate with my own understanding of the mission of the Romanian Cultural Institute under the leadership of Horia and Merchip. And that is what I would describe as the promotion of a broad European humanistic culture. That the, 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 in Romania and through the contacts between Romania and intellectuals in other places, like here, like in Washington, D.C. Um, that is an extraordinarily important task that in some ways is the guiding framework of this conference that relates to a second important task, which is, again, related, but somewhat different. I would describe that as the task of a political historical understanding. And I would say, in fact, most of Vladimir's work, both his work on 
uh, on 1989 and the dissidents, but also his work on the crisis of revisionist Marxism, and in particular the, the commission, the Tismaniano Commission, um, is an instance of this kind of historical uh, 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 remembrance, which is linked, I think, to uh, some of the highest ideals of humanistic scholarship, at the same time that it is a form of social self-understanding and engaged public intellectualism, hugely important. Okay. Another intellectual practice, the intellectual practice of what, what I would call uh, legalism in the broadest of senses and in the best of senses, maybe in which Judith Schlar talked about legalism. That's come up here in a lot of the discussions about law, international law, uh, questions of laws that relate to transitional justice. And there is, in fact, a very venerable tradition of constitutionalism that is emergent from 1989 that is heavily legalistic. In fact, my understanding is that Janos Kish, who was a very important dissident and political theorist of revisionist Marxism and political theorist of uh, you know, the transition, now pretty much spends his time teaching constitutional law, which is a very important thing for, for there to be people who do that. Okay? That's different than intellectual history. It's different than the humanistic cultivated scholarship, but a very important thing, I think, in the post-1989 uh, period. Uh, another, and I'm three more, I'll be really quick, uh, would be what I would call empirically oriented social science, which has been represented on this panel, in, in this conference, uh, uh, by McAdams, and I think particularly by Cornell, but a number of others. Uh, uh, Bradley Abrams was very interesting use of kind of s social science and uh, 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 survey research to, to make some really interesting points that I think are relevant not only to the pre-post-1989 period, but to the post-1989 period. But empirically oriented social science is a very important thing, I think. Um, it, 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 uh, it was important for the development of democracy in the West. Uh, it was in, inseparably linked to, to progressivism in the US. And I think it's important to the development of liberal democracy in Eastern Europe. And it's a different kind of enterprise. And you know the, the work of Soros in uh, supporting the CEU and the development of networks of scholars, social science scholars throughout Eastern Europe is very important. Um, the work of democratic uh, democracy promoters who work on Freedom House or Polity Scores or doing democracy audits or social economic audits, um, very important work. Uh, I want to mention also here the work of, of, of my good friend, M Mihaela Moroyu, who I think does a lot of important work on the question of gender and, and um, the social statistics of gender, which is very important. It's very banal, actually. But again, following up on uh, some of it is banal. Or perhaps it's banal. It's certainly not banal to the people who benefit from the knowledge. But again, gray is beautiful. Banality is important. Journalism. Now, interesting discussions of that here. Micknick, I think, is the best example of someone who, who moved to the intellectual practice of journalism. The journalistic sphere is a central, perhaps the central sphere of a, a post-1989 democratic praxis that relates to all of the issues that Vladimir uh, writes about regarding the siege of, of democratic values. And there is a crisis of journalism and media in post-1989 Europe. And in some ways, there's a crisis of journalism and media here. Okay? And so the, 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 uh, uh, the, the praxis of independent journalism, very important. And here I want to simply point out one more intellectual practice, which I find to be particularly exemplary. And that is the work of uh, uh, Vladimir's and my friend and the friend of some others in this room, um, Miklos Harashti, who uh, went from being a kind of hippie samizdat writer to being uh, uh, an anti-communist activist to being basically an OSCE bureaucrat. He's not really a bureaucrat. Who goes around to every one of the post-communist countries um, evaluating uh, limits on press freedom and freedom of expression and issuing these reports and making these statements and keeping alive the importance of freedom of expression, a very important intellectual practice. So my third point is there's a range of intellectual practices that are important to us that we together practice and I think we should feel good about this and, and in our practice of these different intellectual practices we should also feel comfortable discussing these contentious issues that I re referenced earlier. Now back to the contentious issues. R I'll be really quick here. Why graying uh, democratic intellectuals ought not to think and judge in black and white? My basic point here is that there's some real paradoxes of political judgment. So I want to identify two of them. And then I want to end with a brief quotation from, uh, from myself. Isn't that amazing that I would do that? I can't believe I'm doing that. I'm going to quote myself. Um, okay, and the, the basic theme here is from this piece that I circulated to the people who were involved in the conference, who are on the listserv that I wrote, that I published in Common Knowledge, which is a, an effort to engage how I th what I thought about the fact that my intellectual heroes supported the Iraq War and I didn't. 
okay? So that's, that's where this ends, okay? And I think it's also relevant, by the way, to Iran. It's very important for democracy, and, and, and we ought to talk about it, and we will disagree about it. Good. We're liberals. We live in a democratic society. We should disagree. Okay, so the, the two points I want to make uh, actually both relate to, to Jeff Hurt's paper, which I loved, Jeff Hurt's paper. And it was a kind of counterfactual in some ways, but I mean, he, he, he simply argued that it was a plausible hypothesis that the Euro missiles crisis was a central moment in the undermining of, uh, of uh, the so Soviet system, and it may well have been. And then a, a conversation followed about uh, Agnes Heller and her piece on the new Rapallo and how virtuous Jeff was, and I'm sure he was, for taking the position in 1982. In 1982, I was like, I'm 10 years younger than him. So in 1982, I was like, uh, I was still earning my PhD, and I was actually one of these people who was involved in what Agnes Heller referred to as the so-called peace movement, I was one of those people involved in the so-called peace movement. And um, I remember being involved in debates about the Euro missiles. And, and at the time, there were people making the argument. Agnes Heller made it. I remember reading her piece, and Jeff Herf made it, and others. It was an argument with which I disagreed, which is that we need to do this. There's a, there's a strategic issue. There's also a credibility issue. We need to stare down the Soviets. Okay. Now, it may be that Herf is right. And it may also be that he's not right. This is a complicated question of historical explanation and historical judgment. And again, all he said was that it's a plausible hypothesis. It may be correct. Even if it's correct, I think that there's a step from that, from that determination to the determination that that was the right judgment at the time or the only right judgment at the time. And an interesting question, which our dissident heroes, I think, pose for us, is whether or not there are moments when one ought to act ethically um, in, 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 without consequence being the only criterion. Okay? There are huge questions here, and I don't want to get into them, except to say that the, the peace movement was real. It was not a so-called peace movement. It had many participants who were very sincere. Some of them were stupidly sincere. In some ways, I was. I'm not saying that I think now that my judgments then were correct. I don't think they were, actually. But nor am I certain that Jeff Herf's judgment was correct. And the point I want to make here is that these are enormously complicated questions that we, as celebrants of 1989, can I honor as questions, um, relates to another paradox. Latin America, I, I should tell you something that relates to Iran as well. And it hasn't really come up here. Um, many people of my generation, which is the generation after Jeff's generation, who came of age in the 70s in American higher education, um, for lots of very good reasons, were very concerned, not simply about what the Reagan administration was doing in Europe, but what they were doing in Latin America. What they were doing in Latin America was supporting uh, regimes and paramilitary forces that were killing human rights activists and raping and murdering nuns. Now, that's not all they were doing. And I'm being deliberately provocative here. That's not all they were doing. And it's also true, I think Jeff is right. There wasn't a complete discontinuity between Carter and that. Enormously complicated. But I want to I want to point out two interesting paradoxes which I think should cause us to be cautious about our political judgments retrospectively. One is that uh, Carroll is quite right when he pointed out that solidarity was not only a revisionist movement, but also a movement of the church left and was inspired in many ways by, by Catholic personalist theologians. And um, while the Reagan administration was supporting the personalist Catholic theologians who were struggling against communism in Poland, it was also supporting uh, death squads who were killing the personalist theologians in Guatemala and El Salvador. Fact. Fact. Interesting fact. What does that mean for the way we think about our judgments of the past? What does it mean for the way people from New York, for example, talk to people from Budapest and, and, and Bucharest? Um, I, I don't think E.P. Thompson got the best of the debate with Kolakowski, but there's a real debate there. A real debate. There's, you know, uh, I, I reread last night Havel's piece, Anatomy of Irreticence. It's a brilliant piece. It's brilliant. And I, I honor it even in those places where it makes me a little uncomfortable be, because he's kind of talking at, about me at a certain point in my life. Fine. I honor it. But I also honor some of my mentors who were leaders of the so called peace movement who he did not comprehend any more than they comprehended him. Fact. Okay. Second point. So uh, another friend of ours, I'm almost done, but you've got to give me a minute. 
A friend of ours, Andres Bozoki, who teaches at CEU, came to my university last week and gave a talk about 1989, and he made a really interesting remark. He said that he was involved in the negotiated transition in, in Hungary. He said that they were reading O'Donnell and Schmitter's Transitions to Democracy, that O'Donnell and Schmitter's analysis of the pact of transitions in Latin America it inspired them and helped them to think about what they were doing. Now, that's interesting, and I think it's true, and even Micknick in his uh, New Evolutionism referenced some of these issues, okay? Why is this interesting? Because the democratic activists who were engaged in the pacted transitions of the democratic third wave in the late 70s and, and 80s, in Latin America, the democratic activists were fighting the governments that were supported by the United States at the same time that the U.S. in the Cold War was on the right side of the issue that brings us here together. How is that possible, to be on the right side of one issue and be wrong? Well, it's possible. And so I'll end by quoting my friend Adam Micknick. Gray is beautiful. And I don't think in this complicated world of ours, we can judge in black and white. And what this means is that one of the things that we learn from 1989 is a whole series of questions that still exist for those countries. We're in a common discourse about that, but there are also a whole series of questions, including questions maybe even of retributive justice, that exist for people uh, it, more broadly who care about democracy as an unfinished project. Thank you. Jeff? Oh. Uh, thanks very much, Jeffrey. Uh, listening to you, uh, I think I may have an explanation as to why the revolution in 1989 took place, um, uh, which you offered. Uh, and that is that, um, like the uh, French monarchy in 1789 and like the Tsarist regime in 1917, the communist governments, including the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, managed to antagonize most everybody in their own societies except the loyal members of the Communist Party. They antagonized the, what became the social democratic left um, uh, in Eastern Europe. They antagonized people who, if they were in, living in Western Europe or in the United States, would have joined the peace movements. Uh, uh, or if they were in Latin America, would have been fighting against American imperialism. Uh, and uh, uh, the Soviet leaders in the early, in the late 70s were, as I said yesterday, were warned by uh, Helmut Schmidt and others that if they continued on this path, they would antagonize everybody. And that's what they did. And so uh, there was this moment in, by 1989 when there, as, as you very well described, there was a great plurality of people who disagreed about a lot of things. Some people read Hayek, other people thought Hayek was terrible, and other people read Keynes and they thought he was wonderful. And they all agreed on one thing, this has got to go. Um, and uh, we don't want a dictatorship anymore. It was an anti-communist uh, revolt, but it was an anti-dictatorial revolt. And, it was, and the anti-dictatorial dimension was for some people more important than the, than the anti-communist one. Uh, and that's, I, I think your talk really captures something important about 1989, uh, uh, that plurality of opposition. And like every great uh, transformation, that unity is not gonna persist. And so what's happened in the last 20 years uh, is perfectly understandable, that people who, who really disagreed from the outset, now, now they can disagree peacefully. Um, and just, uh, I thought of what, uh, Gail Stokes' uh, point. The, the, the tragedy of 1989 is that it happened uh, so, it, it happened at a time when China and India were now major economic uh, factors in, in the world economy. Uh, whereas in, after 1945, 49, the Western Europeans had very easy. Uh, there was no labor competition from Eastern Europe, uh, not to mention labor competition from China or other parts of the world. So it was easy uh, to have a very high standard of living and much more difficult to develop successful market economies after 1989. But I really think that your, your remarks um, uh, in a way are even more insightful than you may have realized. I, th I, think, I think in there, there is, there is an explanation 
um, as to uh, why this remarkable thing happened in 1989. Well, I'd just like to thank you and really say, I, I mean, so maybe there's justice in this, uh, this uh, reciprocity. Um, I actually probably think you were right about the Euro missiles. I mean, I, I raise this as a question because I think we really ought to be really cautious about a kind of like Victor's reading of the past. But uh, anyway, I, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Stefan Bennett in New York. Um, I, I guess it's, I'm going to oversimplify it just because of the times. I guess it's a wishful thinking, the gray proposed by uh, Adam. Uh, I think n the world, the way it, it's the, the, area, the reality is that we have gray situations, but we have also evils in the world. One of them I consider uh, under, under our own eyes, uh, uh, Chavez. So when you have a situation like Chavez, you have to have a black or a white. It's one of the two. And in the world, there are spots, and that's exactly what, unfortunately, the United States was supposed to do in the, during the 50s, 60s, 70s, during the Cold War. There were plenty of things like that. And we are all, all of us here definitely against war, against uh, uh, taking over, against dictatorships. But how can we achieve when we have a situation of black and white? That's the thing. We, we have to do something, so. That, that's a great point, and, and I would simply say, you know, Camus wrote about the Cold War that he, he supported a quarter truth uh, in, against a lie. And, and I, I, I could go there. I, I don't believe in black and white, even with, with whether it's Chavez or Bin Laden or whatever. I believe in right and wrong. Um, by the way, to say that, lib that, that liberal democracy is a zone of gray, there is outside that zone. But I don't believe in absolute evil. I don't. And I think that we should be wary of attributions of attribute evil politically. Politically, we should be wary. Morally or religiously, maybe we shouldn't be wary. Politically, we should be wary. Why? Well, because often in the name of that, with that armed with that self-understanding, new forms of tyranny are enacted, and huge mistakes are made. By the way, I think that this happened in Iraq, okay? Um, and this also is very complicated. And I'm not saying I'm in favor of like immediate withdrawal from Iraq or anything. And I supported the war in Afghanistan, not the war in Iraq. But I think that Micnick and these people quickly, too quickly, jumped to the conclusion that Saddam Hussein was Stalin or Hitler. He wasn't. He was a totalitarian dictator. It was a republic of fear. It was also not a regime practicing genocide at the moment. There were very interesting debates. Michael Walzer took this position. The position I'm taking now is exactly his position, okay? But m the point is simply, I, we should be hesitant of jumping too quickly to black and white. Uh, is there ever black or white? Well, I, it's not, I'm not suggesting we don't judge, but I'm, I, I do wanna say this. The zone of liberal democracy is a broad zone of gray. Within that broad zone, let's have honest debate. There's also outside the zone. I'm not in favor of trying to have dialogue. I, I organized an anti-hate group in Bloomington that was fighting neo-Nazis. And there were people in my community that were like in publicly in the newspaper inviting them to come to town. Let's dialogue. It's like, no, no. I'm not interested in dialoguing with neo-Nazis. But I still think even there, we should be wary of attributing absolute righteousness to our cause. Well, let me, uh, uh, since I actually have the mic. Um, I was wondering, and I found your comments fascinating, actually. Um, but I wonder if uh, part of it, it's not with the benefit of hindsight. And, and, I, and I think you would recognize it is with the benefit of hindsight. I, I find it hard to, to understand how a revolutionary could have a great look at the world revolutions are black and white. It's either, you know, you change the system or you don't change the system. It's, it, everybody else is a reformist. Um, in, in, that, in that respect, I think that um, 
you know, for, for, for the people behind the wall, behind the, the Iron Curtain, um, it was a black and white issue. The, there, was, there was no room for debate for the dissidents. This, the system was wrong. And you know, for, for people like that, it's hard to, to, uh, um, to understand uh, the gray that, you would, that, that, that we would see historically in, in, in some of the characters. Um, just as for, for people on, you know, in the West, it's hard to understand the gray within characters on, on, on the other side or for characters on, 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 uh, in, in the West, you know, for, for Reagan, for example, or, or anyone else. So I wonder if that's not the part of, of hindsight that actually allows us, yeah, for historians, they're certainly gray. I mean, history is, 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 is a study of the gray. In, 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 in the end, but for the revolutionary, for the people on the, on the ground, I find that um, I wonder if they actually have the benefit of, of seeing the world in gray. You know, Mick Nix, my favorite essay by him is a piece called Maggots and Angels, which is in Letters from Prison, and it's all about this, this way of counterposing good and evil, which he says is politically dangerous, and um, he, the, the, me, the gray metaphor is his. I mean, I, I don't want to, I'm playing with it. You know, I also mixed metaphors. I said that there's a, a bright palette of colors that doesn't include black, white, and brown, like the pink of gender liberation and the green. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too hung up on the, the metaphorics of gray. I do agree with you that there are, uh, in, within, in a liberal context, we can appreciate a gray zone of liberalism, and in a non-liberal context, if we're, we're, let's say, besieged by an oppressive state, or we're in fear, or we don't know who to trust, it's harder to do that, I agree. Uh, in authoritarian context, do democratic activists need to, need to view uh, their opponents as political enemies? Y y yeah, I think they do. Do they need to make strong mo ethical, moral judgments in order to act? I think they do. But even in those cases, they don't need to like imagine like lynching those people. And there is a metaphor. Th there, that's deep in the revolutionary tradition, I think. And one of the great things, and here I'm following on Carol, who has his hand up, but uh, probably I'm going to have to call on Yulia next and then Carol. But, you know, the, the, one of the, the important points of Carol's paper is I do think that the, you know, the Micknicks and the Havels made clear the, 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 the power of nonviolent, a kind of nonviolent resistance, which takes a stand without vilifying even one's enemy. Uh, I will not be so optimistic about you know about the we at about uh, now after this conference I think you know it's a big difference between us from Eastern Europe how we understand 1980 and and here people from Western country how they understand the event and I think that in between these two categories there are people just kind of translators, you know, they want to translate for you and like people like Vladimir, for instance, or other people who live in between these two spaces. But basically, I think that we stay in these two categories that, that our understanding about the events are, are different. And it's only in this moment that uh, I I have the full understanding of, of this, uh, this way. And in my remark is related in a sense with what my, my colleague just said about, you know, that uh, the gray, really the gray, it's not for people who live in during this time. And why I don't think, you know, we don't, we don't have this kind of pluralism in this moment in Eastern Europe. And it is very difficult to have this pluralism. And why I'm very skeptical that what Cornell had said can be done. Because you know, once you speak about social democracy, you have to, you have to rethink the Marxism. And this is the b basic thinking, you know, that nobody in social, in social theory or in political philosophy nowadays uh, had the rethinking of Marxism after communism. And since, I, I don't know everybody who did this. You know, since this moment, everybody, I know a lot of people who you know, they just reinventing Marxist or peace movement or whatever, and they don't take into account what happened during communism, or they take into account, you know, in, in different kind of idealistic interpretation. But since there, you know, of course, it's important what you said, that there are people that are fighting for women, women rights, in one sense and you know for European culture it's okay it's fine but since this moment I think you know this is the basic 
the basic thing, you know, and this is the reason why our intelligentsia, it's an intelligentsia which is more directed to the, to the right in a, in a very clear way. And uh, this intelligentsia from here, it's clearly, you know, directed to the left. And every time that I go to the conference, I have the same, the same, you know, misunderstanding that uh, I, I confronted, which is, which is a big misunderstanding in a way. And I think that if we don't, if if these political theorists here will not reevaluate, you know, Marxism after communism, we are not going to have this understanding. Uh, very few political theorists here care about Marxism after communism. They don't. They're not Marxists. Okay. But I would simply say this, because I would simply say, don't please don't take me as a, an exemplary American or ac American academic political theorist or anything else. I, I just said what I thought. There are many people, including people in this room, who like also come from New York, who probably think different things. Jeff Herf is probably one of them. And I, in the same way, I don't know why you think that that you represented our intelligentsia as being to the right. I know lots of East Europeans. Some of them are more to the right. Some of them are not to the right. I mean, in fact, one of the points I'm making here is that this is an Arendtian point. The human condition is plural, okay? Political, ide political ideologies put us in, in boxes, and the boxes may serve some useful political functions. But that's a different thing than to essentialize them. I don't believe that there is a East European experience any more than I believe there's an American experience. Now, what I said about Jeff Herf is I'm really interested in learn in, in like listening to him, talking about the past, talking about the present, arguing, mutual understanding, and I I think maybe to respond to you because Cornell made this point. I mean, in the 1950s, European Social Democratic parties officially gave up Marxism. Okay, um, and I don't believe that, for example, Michael Walzer, who's the editor of the said magazine, was never a Marxist, ever, ever. I just don't believe that social democracy is kind of like, has the burden of, of dealing with Marxism. I'm not a Marxist either, by the way. This, please. 